But muskets aren't the only weapon that's going on. Um, you would have at the highest point of ground artillery, which are long-range weapons that would fire down into the lines, once again, to try to break them down. These are very powerful weapons, and they need a whole team of people to fire it just once. Let's take a look. This is in Colonial Williamsburg. You can see there's a crew of four people. Any one of these guys goes down, this weapon now is inoperable. So you need four people to be able to operate and fire this weapon. When it comes out, it's a molten, molten ball of lead that's traveling faster than the speed of sound. Often they would connect chains in between them that did increase the amount of damage that they could do. And cannons could be devastating. A lot of biting things in the American Revolution. Probably a lot of lead poisoning, too. Still going. Remember, people are shooting at them this whole time. Yep. And that's one shot. Just to kind of give you a view of once all these different things come together, what it looks like. This is a couple clips thrown together from a fantastic movie called The Patriot. Um, oh, I paused it. So here you see the British lines marching in and the American lines. You wear down your opponents trying to get your line thinner. You can see the commander on horseback in the back so they get a view over uh, their their lines so that way they can give orders. How would you like to be the person uh, carrying the flag as people are shooting at you? Yikes. And you can see the explosions of the cannon fire that they're marching into the artillery. Um, most of the battles like this don't work out well for the Americans. You can see the British have more soldiers, larger lines, more experienced. It's just not great. But where the Americans have a lot of success is in battles like this one. A hit and run ambush. Soldiers delivering supplies in between uh, their fortresses, delivering messages. These small hit and run ambushes are where the Americans really wear down the British over time and are able to eventually win the war. Along with a few key battles hitting the uh, hitting the getting the ones that count the most here we go some more guerrilla warfare in the swamps of massachusetts, uh, massachusetts swamps of uh south carolina this is reenacting francis marion's guerrilla war in south carolina the swamp fox standard weapon of the american revolution is the brown bass musket um, it is gigantic. You're talking about a very heavy piece of weaponry. Um, it is a uh, multiple weapons in one. The brown bass musket was used to, A, be a firing weapon. Uh, but once the lines got close, you charged at your opponent, and you weren't really firing this thing anymore. Now you'd be using this hardened end basically as a bludgeon weapon. And up close would be a weapon called a bayonet. And the Americans weren't really skilled in bayonet uh, battle, whereas the British were. And we're going to see that that's something they're going to have to learn during the course of war to be able to compete with them. A guy by the name of Baron von Steuben is going to be really important in that. The bayonet would be affixed onto the end of this, and basically it's like a long spiny fork that's designed to pierce into a person and basically mix up their insides. Not a nice way to go with the bayonet. And somebody bayonets a person from that line, that person might not be dead, but they're not going to be fighting anymore. And that's the way, basically, you keep wearing down and wearing down and wearing down until one side gives up. Usually, you'd see one side sending soldiers on horseback, a cavalry, if they're starting to lose, to try to break it, to save them. But um, that kind of gives you an idea, generally, what battles are like during this. Also, let's just take a look at um, some musket balls. 
and I put those next to like modern bullets. As you can see, the shape of these is a lot different. Yes, these are really heavy caliber, like a musket ball. We're talking about like 50 caliber. They're really big. They'll put a pretty big hole in you. Um, but if you look, you're like balls. Balls are designed like a basketball. It's designed to bounce. So when you fire a musket ball through a, uh, a rifle, it's going to bounce many, 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 many times before it comes out. That's why they're not very accurate. If you think of a bullet, it's shaped like a football. It spins in the barrel as it's about uh, when it's fired, so that way it cuts a hole through the air. So that's why musket balls are not nearly as accurate as bullets. Um, the first battle that you're going to read about is uh, going to be the Battle of Bunker Hill. This takes place about a year before the actual signing of the Declaration in June of 1775. Um, after the losing Lexington and Concord, the British like want to take Boston, occupy Boston, make that their main launching post for what they see as now a insurrection war against the Americans. And they want to drive the Americans out. So they know that the Americans pretty much have the hills around Boston uh, where they are encamped. And if they want to be able to move into the Massachusetts countryside, they can't have the Americans shooting down from them on these cannons. So the battle begins long before the sun comes up when British ships start firing cannons into these hills where the Americans are. Um, the most famous of these was called Bunker Hill, which is also a military term. It's a kind of a mil an earthen fortress made to withstand firing. So it made sense to call it Bunker Hill. Historically, you know, it's not entirely accurate. Most of the fighting takes place on Breed's Hill. Anywho, um, the Americans are really uh, not in a great position. The British outnumber them about four to one. They are low on ammunition. They don't have a lot of musket balls and gunpowder. It's They're really in a bad situation. So as the smoke is still starting to clear, the British start sending columns of British soldiers up to basically chase away the last Americans. They figure most of them have already left, got blasted by the cannon fire all, night, all day. But... They've been waiting. They've been dug in in these bunkers, waiting for the British. And they're waiting and waiting. The British now are marching up. This massive red wave of soldiers is marching up the hill closer and closer and closer. And one of the American commanders, a guy by the name of William Prescott, um, knows that they have to make every musket ball count. They can't waste a single shot. So as the British are marching closer and firing on them, he tells them to wait. Wait, wait for it. The, the quote that's often attributed to him is, hold your fire till you see the whites in their eyes. Wait till they're so close that you can see the whites around their eyeballs. And then shoot them. Make every shot count. And the first advancement of British soldiers is pretty much wiped out. British commander sends up another wave of soldiers. Well, that, this, this can't be. Now this wave of British soldiers, second advancement, has to climb over the first advancement because they're all laying dead on the ground. And when they get to the top of the hill, Prescott and his forces again, blam, hit them. Hit them with every shot they have. And they're able to take out two advancements of uh, British forces. 40% um, of the British forces overall that were in the battle are taken out. But then the Americans run out of ammo. They lose because they run out of bullets. So they could have kept on fighting. They were winning the British. They proved that they could stand with the British as long as they had ammunition. But the Americans, if you don't have ammunition, you can't, you know, what are you going to do? Start spitting at them? Tickle them? You know, they had, a, they had to retreat. They had to leave the battlefield. And ultimately, Bunker Hill would be a loss. But it's often referred to as a moral victory because the Americans showed that they could stand up against the bigger British army and hold their own. Here's a couple of shots. Here you see uh, Commander Prescott, this hand out, saying, wait for it, wait for it. One of the things I like about this painting is that it shows 
the Americans, they're not a, a uniformed army yet. These are all like, you know, people in their street clothes who are going up against the full might of the British army. And here you see the British soldiers marching up the hill, and you can see the first column, or the first few columns of soldiers, uh, the advancement, all laying on the hill as they're marching up to most likely their doom. Once again, I wouldn't want to be the drummer. So my question for you is, even though Bunker Hill is seen as a loss, why in American, many Americans' eyes was it a win? Write down your answer. And then tomorrow, since we talked about Rocky, we're going to talk about another uh, great boxer. Uh, this one actually real, a guy by the name of Mike Tyson. So I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great Monday.